Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. A great day, actually. Yeah, give me a thumbs up if that's the case. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see a lot of... Oh, I see thumbs down there. I hope that was uh, that was a joke. No, unfortunately not, but it has nothing to do with this uh, wonderful oh, event. Okay. Right. I had to go to the hospital this morning, so... Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope everything's fine with you and your family. Yeah, it wasn't okay. my bones. It was of okay. my son, so... Oh. Sorry to hear that. I hope he no. recovers soon and quickly. Yeah, yeah. All Thank right. you. Okay. So the next agenda item here is, uh, I hope you're appropriate, appropriately excited for that. That's the keynote by uh, keynote speech by Simon Wadley. Simon is in the call with us. For those who do not know Simon, he's a researcher for the Leading Edge Forum. He has built and run several companies over the years. And in his own words, he believes in death by PowerPoint. <laughs> and of course, you will have the chance to ask him questions afterwards. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Simon. Thank you ever so much. Yes, death by um, death by PowerPoint. My my young boy, um, not so long ago, um, broke his leg actually as well. He's he totally recovered as well. So, um, uh, uh, Michael, uh, whatever's happened, uh, I I hope your young boys, uh, your boys, all right. Um, so, um, I, I'm first of all going to start uh, by sharing a screen. Do, 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 do. There we are. Um, hopefully you can all see Crossing the Rivers by Feeling the Stones. Yes. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk about a, a concept known as mapping. Uh, now, to begin with, I'll give you a little bit of agenda. I'm going to talk about the subject of strategy, uh, where I came from. Uh, then I'm going to get into maps. And then I'm going to get into uh, being trapped by context. And then I'm going to talk about patterns. And after this, I've got a bit of a, a magical mystery tour. Uh, we can go into organizational structure uh, with a particular method called Pioneer Settler Town Planner, or we can talk about nation state competition and uh, digital sovereignty. It's quite a big subject, uh, but that means we have to get into deep into culture and various other aspects as well. So in total, uh, do, 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 do. Well, we'll start here. Those extra subjects take a little bit of time. We'll see how far we get, uh, how much of those um, can be covered. So let's start with the issue of strategy. So many years ago, I used to work uh, for this company. Uh, it was called Fatango. It was an online photo service. Um, it had about 16 different lines of business. It was very profitable. Uh, revenue was rapidly growing, uh, but it had a problem. Uh, and, and that problem uh, was the CEO. Uh, the CEO of our company um, didn't have a clue what they were doing. Uh, they were making it up as they went along. Uh, and I know this because I was the CEO. I, I was completely clueless. Um, the revenue was growing, profit going up. That was fantastic. I was always worried that people would, would discover and rumble or that I, I was making stuff up. Uh, I used to produce these these wonderful sort of vision statements, and I used to think they were wonderful. Uh, they were pretty much garbage. Uh, this is for Tango in 2003. Um, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. So a friend of mine is a person called Kent Beck who created something called Extreme Programming. Uh, we'd adopted X XP throughout the organization in 2002. Uh, of course, by 2004, we'd realized it doesn't work everywhere. Um, uh, we were heavy users of open source. Uh, I, I pretty much hired the entire uh, Perl Pumpkin community. So we, we maintained the language Perl as well as uh, a writing in it. And uh, we, we released a lot of stuff. Um, but the problem with this statement was that I'd simply pinched it actually from another company uh, and uh, just changed a few words. So I, I started going around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. I, I would listen to the words they would use and I recorded the common words. I called them blahs or business level abstractions of a healthy strategy. And I, I've done this every few years. So this was about 2013, 2014. Uh, the common blahs were digital business, uh, big data, uh, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, 
competitive advantage ecosystem, open source, blah, blah, blah. And, and what I also did was grab companies' strategy and vision statements and smash them together. And, and I created what I called the blah template. So our strategy is blah. Uh, we will lead a blah effort of the market through the use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I would take the words and the template and just smash them together and also generated, uh, you know, random strategies, uh, you know, usually groups of 64 at a time. Uh, 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 things like this, uh, our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focused competitive advantage and disruptive social media to build a collaborative revolution. I mean, again, it's just total gibberish. It's just words. Uh, but I would send this around to people. And last time I did this, and this was about 2014, I haven't done it since then. Um, I got about 400 responses, uh, three basic types. Uh, the first was, um, this is the exact wording from our business plan. Uh, the second was, I've seen two of these used already. And the third, and my, 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 my favorite was, was are you for hire? So a friend of mine has now put this all online. Um, this is strategy as a service. So if you ever need a strategy, you just, just type in the URL at the bottom and it will automatically create you one based upon nothing whatsoever. I mean, you can, if you wish, you can pretend there's blockchain and AI because those are popular blahs these days behind it. Um, you know, it's uh, digital transformation or whatever, you know, if you wish. Um, it's not, it's just taking the words and smashing them into that template. So our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market through our use of big data and, uh, you know, it's just meaningless. So I was, I, I was um, back in 2004, 2005, I was seeing this going on. I knew I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I was sort of starting to suspect I might not be alone. Um, I, I was, in, in some respect, getting a little bit worried uh, about, you know, eventually people would discover. So I started reading every strategy book I could find. And I, I was just getting absolutely nowhere. And then I was in a bookseller's and uh, the bookseller, she, she persuaded me to buy a, a book called Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I'd never read it before. And she persuaded me to buy two copies because um, they're both all translations. And it was through reading the second copy uh, that I, I noticed a particular pattern. Now that pattern is part of what I call the strategy cycle. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. The first is have um, your purpose, your mor moral imperative. The second is to understand your landscape, the environment you're competing in. The third is to understand the climactic patterns so how that landscape is changing. Uh, the fourth is to uh, orient, well, to un understand principles, uh, doctrine, uh, the ways of operating. And the fifth uh, factor that mattered was leadership. So this is where we're into gameplay. And this overlaps with something created by John Boyd. And John Boyd was a US Air Force pilot. And he created something known as the OODA loop. So the first O of the OODA loop is to observe the environment. And that's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. It's understanding the space and how it's changing. Then you need to orientate yourself around the space. And that's what principles and operating principles and doctrine are about. And then you need to decide where you're going to attack. And then you act. Um, so O for observe, orient, O, decide and act, DA. That's the OODA loop. And so this made a lot of sense to me. And in the heart of this is two whys, the why of purpose, your moral imperative, and the why of movement. So the best way of thinking about this is to think of a game of chess, where the why of purpose might be to win the game, and the why of movement is, do I move this piece or that piece? And it's through playing this game and going round the cycle that you, you get better at this. And of course, every time we act, it might change our purpose, our moral imperative, and of course, it changes the landscape. And this is why a company like Nokia starts off as a paper mill and eventually a plastics manufacturer and eventually a telecommunications company and, and, and whatever it is today. So this was quite useful for me. And, but at the heart of this was this question of landscape. 
And so I started looking into military history, um, particularly their use of maps. So this is the, the Battle of uh, Thermopylae. So Themistocles, uh, as ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Um, uh, the Persians were invading. There were about 140, 170,000 Persians invading. Uh, they had about uh, 4,000 Greek soldiers available. Um, the Greeks were independent city-states, uh, um, but they had about that number available at that time. Um, and so what they did is they used the navy to block off the Straits of Artemisia, force the Persians along coastal road into a narrow pass, where actually a small number of troops is a, could defend against the larger force because it's narrow, it acts as a force multiplier. And in those 4,000 troops were the 300 Spartans. And this is where we get the story of the 300 from. Now I was looking at this and I thought, well, what sort of tools do I use, did I use to make decisions and choices? And I use things like SWATs. So I thought I'd create a SWAT for this. So SWAT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Um, strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, where Athenian actually we hate the Spartans. And the threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So I put this next to each other and just went, what would I use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Uh, position and movement described by some sort of map or some sort of magic framework like a SWAT diagram. And it was like, well, that's obvious. I'm going to use a map. But then I was looking at my business and I was going, well, what am I using? I'm using SWATs. So, so where, where are my maps? So this brought me into the whole subject of maps. And I started to collect every map that I thought I had in the business. And I had business process maps and mind maps and systems maps and all these sorts of things. I thought, oh, this is great. But then I noticed something a bit odd, is if I took a systems map and I just moved a piece on the map, the map wouldn't change its meaning. Uh, but if I took a geographical map and I moved, say, Australia and put it next to England, that would change the meaning. So what I realized is actually everything I had in business, which I called a map, was in fact a graph. And just to explain the difference, uh, the three images at the top are, are identical. They're all graphs. Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, connected by, by three, um, oh, sorry, two roads. They're identical, they're graphs. The three images at the bottom are completely different and they're maps. And the distinction obviously here is we have this compass and because of that, space has meaning. So if you've got an image of a space and it calls itself a map, you simply test it by moving a piece just slightly left or right or up or down. And if it doesn't change the fundamental meaning of what you're looking at, it's not a map, it's a graph. Because in a map, space has meaning. If you move any of these pieces in a map, it changes the context and meaning of what you're looking at. So maps are really useful for exploring and understanding landscapes because space has meaning. So I thought, right, how do I create one of those in business? So I started off with a tea shop. And I thought, what are the key characteristics that I need within a map? Well, all maps have three basic characteristics. You have an anchor, such as magnetic north. You have the position of pieces, such as this is north, south, east, or west of that. And you have movement and consistency of movement. So if I'm going north, I'm going north. If I'm going south, I'm going south. So I thought, right, I'll take a tea shop. What's the anchor going to be? And I thought, well, okay, I've got the business who's selling tea, and I've got the public who are drinking tea. I've also got government, regulators, etc. but I can put those two to begin with, business and public. And they both have a need for tea. One to consume tea, one to sell tea. Oh, there's a lot of noise in the background. Hello. Ah, super deeper. Thank you, by the way. Um, so, oh. Um, 
Can you all please go on mute? Uh, there is a lot of noise coming in from somewhere. Thank oh, you very wonderful. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you've got business public have a need for a cup of tea. Um, uh, I want to drink, want to sell. Cup of tea, however, has needs. It needs, you need a cup, it needs tea, it needs hot water. Hot water needs cold water, it needs a kettle, and it needs power. So what I can do is describe a chain of needs. Now this gives me position. So from the point of view of a consumer drinking a cup of tea, the cup of tea is very visible to them, it's, it's near to them. Whereas the power used to heat the kettle to make the hot water, to make the cup of tea is very far away, it's very distant. So what I've got is a chain of needs with position in terms of visibility going up the chain. But anchor and position is the starting point. You also need movement, um, consistency of movement. That's the other aspect of the map. And it turns out that all components in competition uh, evolve. They evolve through common stages. The genesis of the novel new, custom built examples, products and uh, commodity and rent uh, utility like services. So by simply putting the pieces where they should be or where we think they should be, we've now got anchor, position and movement. And if I move any piece, doesn't matter which direction, I change the meaning of that map, which is why it's a map. Now, one of the beauties about this is somebody can look at this and say, oh, I'm missing things. What about staff? Right, we can draw that on. Somebody else might say, uh, if I put staff in product, somebody might say they should be robots or more commodity. Somebody else might ask me, why have I got a custom built kettle? Shouldn't that be more commodity? Somebody else might say these components are actually stocks of capital uh, and the lines are flows of capital. So all of this stuff can be put onto a map. And so somebody might go, look, we're using a custom built kettle because of brand exclusivity. Uh, we may, we're making the kettle more visible to the consumer because it gives us some sort of special advantage. Um, so all of this stuff, the metrics, the directions, the inefficiency, the operations, uh, the business side, the development side, can all be put onto a single map. And that's one of the powers of maps is they provide a common language for people to communicate about a space. Okay, so I better give an example. And the example I'm gonna use is Trap by Context. So this is a typical organization. This happened to be an insurance company. Um, this is ooh, a good number of years ago. Uh, they had a process flow. Uh, they needed a uh, compute um, because they were growing rapidly and they would order servers. Uh, servers would go into goods in. Uh, they would modify, mount and rack those servers and that gave them the compute they needed. Now they had a bottleneck around modification of the servers and mounting and racking. And uh, so what they decided to do was invest in robotics to solve this problem. It was a, a six month program, uh, selecting vendors, etc. They produced wonderful business cases, fabulous return investments. So you were talking many, many millions. Uh, return investment was sub one year, uh, a wonderful case of why they should invest in robotics. Now these people are all very smart. None of them are daft. Um, and of course you can't just turn up and say, why are you using robotics? And the reason why you can't is that one of the things we do in, uh, in business is we tell everybody about the importance of storytelling. I, it, you know, your idea didn't succeed because you sold it in the wrong way. So we talk about great leaders being great storytellers, but that creates a problem because now when you challenge a story, you're actually challenging the person who's giving you the story which is why stories are highly political. Um, so I can't just go in there and say, why are you using ro robotics? Because I'm undermining their idea, I'm challenging them. They will just show me all their, uh, their business case, like return investment calculations, et cetera, et cetera. Just be an argument. So I asked them to simply map it. And this took them about 15 minutes. And they went, user needs compute, compute order server, server goods in. And they thought order server, server very much commodity. Compute, they put in a product. I would sort of argue it was a, even though this was about eight years ago, I would argue even then it was a utility. Um, compute needed rack, mount, modify. 
literally 15 minutes. And I was able to look at this and just ask a question. Uh, why have you got rack and custom built? And the answer came back, um, well, we have custom built racks. We have a company who makes our racks for us. Ah, so what are the modifications you're doing to servers? Well, the servers we buy don't fit our racks. And so we have to take the cases off them, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit our racks. Right. And that's why you need robotics. Yes. And of course, immediately in the room, just somebody went, why aren't we using standard racks? Well, that's a good question. And the answer for this is that um, at some point in time, it made sense to use custom built racks. And that had become part of the narrative and the story of the place. And so it's difficult to challenge until you can see the environment. And of course, when I challenge a map, I'm not challenging the person or the storyteller. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying something's wrong with the map. So it's a way of neutralizing a lot of those politics and getting challenge into a place. So this is probably the most common thing I see in business. Um, people spending their time optimizing process flow uh, and, and ignoring what I call evolutionary flow. Uh, the fact is the racks are very much more commodity. You shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't certainly shouldn't be investing in robotics to solve this uh, bottleneck. And of course, once you've done that, then what you realize is that compute itself is actually more of a utility. So actually, you don't need any of this stuff below. So I'll give you another example, big heavy engineering project. Uh, this is HS2 High Speed Rail. And um, this is James Finley, who's the uh, CIO, was the CIO. Uh, what they decided to do was to build the entire railway in a virtual world festival. And the, and the reason for this is pretty simple. If you dig up a virtual world and you get it wrong, it's, it doesn't cost you a great deal of money. Uh, if you dig up the English countryside at mass scale and you put it in the wrong place, it does. So they decide to build the entire railway in a virtual world. Now, this is the system diagram of building this. Now, it's not a map, it's a graph. So if I look at this uh, diagram, if I just take a component, like on the left-hand side, you've got finance. If I move it down slightly, it doesn't change the meaning of it. If I move it up slightly, as long as you keep the lines the same, that's because it's a graph, not a map. So James's problem was this. This is what we need to do. How do I manage this? Do I, which bits do I outsource? Which bits do I build in-house? Which bits do I use off-the-shelf products? Okay. Uh, just those three questions alone um, in a diagram like this creates 387 million possible permutations. So uh, 387 million, 429,000, there we are. So, you know, do I outsource this bit, off-the-shelf products here, etc.? So what do I choose? How do I do this? So what James did was sit down. It was an afternoon uh, on a Sunday and... Um, he was looking at this map, uh, oh, sorry, looking at this diagram, uh, and he's thinking, well, what, what do we normally do? We normally do do this. We just outsource the whole lot because it's just too complex otherwise. And then we normally break this into lots. Uh, so we group things because they sound familiar. So we'll group, you know, we'll, we'll do a contract for user experience, a contract for back office, a contract for infrastructure, a contract for engineering. That's how we normally do things. And so he sat down and said, I'm gonna do it slightly different. I'm gonna draw a map. And so that's the paper map that he drew. And he's a good friend of mine. So he just took a picture of it, phoned me up, and, uh, sent it over email. And I took his map, tidied it up a little bit. This was back in 2012. And I said, okay, you've got these components. What's your problem? And he was, well, how do I manage it? Well, one of the things I'd learned back in 2005, 2006, when I'd started mapping, uh, the first maps I produced for myself was in 2005, is that all the components are evolving. And they start off on the left-hand side in this uncharted space. doesn't matter whether it's money, computing, or penicillin, where it's unknown, undefined, uh, constantly changing. And then over time, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, dull, boring, repeatable. And because of this, we'd learned that there's no such thing as one size fits all methods. 
So things like agile extreme programming were very good on the left hand side because they helped us reduce the cost of change. So, well, they were good at coping with change. Whereas Six Sigma and outsourcing was very good on the right hand side um, because it was all about reducing deviation, which is what you want with a more commodity. Whereas Lean, and so we're talking Scrum, MVP, those sorts of, and other artifacts, were very good at the middle because it's all about learning and reducing waste. And there is no one size fits all magic method, which does the whole lot. Um, now, that's something we learned in 2005, 2006. Uh, of course, you know, you have to be careful when you turn up to a conference and say, you know, you go to an agile conference and say agile doesn't fit everywhere. You know, or we go to a Six Sigma conference and say Six Sigma doesn't fit everywhere. It's got its context. You know, you often get a bit of burn in heretic um, because sometimes these can be rather um, or almost semi-religious uh, ideas. But, but uh, you know, reality each has its, its, its place. So that's what we did. We used appropriate methods. Uh, uh, we outsourced the stuff on the right-hand side. Uh, much more to utility providers where possible, used off-the-shelf products in the middle, and the left hand built in-house with agile techniques uh, using very much lightweight extreme program. Now this project ended up uh, in front of the Public Accounts Committee because it was delivered way under budget and way ahead of schedule. Now normally what we would have done is outsource the whole lot uh, and um, apply that lot structure. So what I want to do is just have a quick look at what would have happened if we'd done that. And I'll just pick one area, lot one engineering. So this is the map. And what I've done is I'm saying I'm outsourcing the whole lot. Okay, so no agile, no lean, outsource the whole lot. And there's my lot structure, lot one engineering. Now, I can tell you this is going to be a massive problem before we've even signed the contract or started. And the reason for this is the stuff on the right hand side we can actually define in a contract and so it will be efficiently treated but the stuff on the left hand side will incur excessive change control costs because we cannot define it and the thing is we'll just end up with a fight with the vendor when the project cost overruns and uh, and the ven you know will say what's going on and the vendor will tell us it's all our fault uh, and it's all our fault because we we didn't specify it correctly well, we couldn't specify correctly. I mean, the worst case example is somebody on your side goes, next time we need to specify it better. I mean, that's just like a total disaster. Uh, the, the reality is you need to break it down into components and apply the right methods. So another example, emergency services, mobile communication platform, critical infrastructure. This is for police radio. It's radios for police, fire, ambulances, etc. Wonderful 600 page document specification. And um, so looking at that, um, it was like, what's the user need? Nobody was quite sure. It's in there somewhere. So I asked them to map it. So they started off with, you know, who are the users, police, and fire, etc. What do they need? Point to point communication, point to multiple point, job dispatch, etc. And underneath this are a heck of a lot of other components as well. Now, once you've done that, then you can start going, right, okay, how do we manage this? Well, we break it into small groups, keeping it fairly vertical, so we don't want to go horizontal and mixing, you know, in uncharted with industrialized. Uh, so we need to more outsource the stuff on the right, build in-house on the left, etc. Pretty straightforward. Now, in this case, they decided, no, we don't want to do that. That's just too complex and, and went with their typical um, uh, uh, lot type structure. And that's ended up with cost overruns and all the rest of it. Um, it's one of the most common things I end up doing is that, you know, you go in, companies are out to sign these massive contracts. You simply map it out, you overlay the contracts, and you can just go, that contract will fail, that contract will fail, that contract, that one's okay. Because people just... Yeah, once you've mapped it, it becomes quite obvious that they're mixing the wrong techniques together. Okay. But this wasn't wasted, despite the fact that they ignored it and decided to go off and do lot structure, uh, because we also had other people mapping, borders, immigration, police. And so one of the powers of maps is you share them. 
And by sharing them, we would start to see duplication in government. So for example, uh, user registration, um, you know, six different systems doing exactly the same thing. Uh, five of them more commodity, and one of them is sort of more custom built. So what we've got is duplication of the same thing, uh, and of course bias in the way we're treating things. Now, before anybody thinks I'm having a pop-up government here, I am absolutely not. Uh, and the reason for this is fairly simple. The worst example I found in any government anywhere of duplication is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing. Uh, we've managed to build prisoner registration 118 different ways, one for every prison. Uh, I, in the private sector, I've got a pharma company, 350 teams building enterprise content management systems, uh, five global efforts to build the global enterprise content management system, none of which are talking to each other. The worst examples I've got are in the financial sector. So I've got a bank who's managed to build risk management over a thousand times. So anybody who thinks that government is wasteful and inefficient, you know, it's not compared to the private sector. The private sector excels uh, at waste and inefficiency at a scale which just could not exist within government because we often have bodies like the National Audit Office or you know Major Projects Authority or Spend Control, which are designed to deliberately challenge some of this stuff. Okay. So I talked about strategy and maps, and I got talked about being trapped by context. Because one of the things you have to remember is not that people are daft that they do these things. It's because they cannot see the environment. And if you're being ruled by stories, so you cannot see the environment, you've got stories, it's also really difficult to challenge the stories. And it's difficult to challenge the stories because they're highly political. Okay, let's talk about patterns. Once you start observing the landscape, then you start to notice there are patterns. So there are three basic types of patterns. Uh, climactic patterns, these are like the rules of the game. And in economic systems, we call them economic patterns. Then you've got doctrine, so these are principles of operating. And then you've got leadership and gameplay. Now there's a lot and we have limited time. Uh, climactic patterns, there's about 30 of those. There's about 40 different forms of doctrine and there's about 110 different forms of gameplay. Most people are oblivious to all of this. And you, you will be because you can't see the environment and that's perfectly normal. So let's go through some of the climactic patterns. I'm going to take a simple uh, uh, map. User needs an application built on best coding practice, built on a runtime operating system, best architectural practice, built on compute as a product. So this is computing uh, around about 2005. Um, you can mix um, practices, activities, data, knowledge, all on a single map because they all evolve through common stages. We just give them different labels. So um genesis custom product commodity for an activity or novel emerging good and best for a practice uh, uh, concept uh, um, hypothesis theory accepted for say knowledge um it's just we use different labels to describe those different stages of evolution so this is a very very simple map and the first pattern you learn is everything evolves if there's supply and demand competition uh, then everything moves from left to right. And so we knew back in 2005 that compute at some point was going to become more of a utility, and that would give us certain benefits of efficiency. Um, the second pattern you learn is that past success breeds inertia. And that inertia can come from existing physical capital and existing uh, practices. And in fact, there's 16 different forms of inertia. So the example to think of is Blockbuster, Blockbuster versus Netflix. Blockbuster was first with video ordering online, first with a website, first with video streaming experiments, and also first to go bankrupt. And the reason for this is not because it lacked innovation, it out-innovated everyone. Its problem was past success. Uh, and in this case, late fees. Late fees depended upon a physical store. That's where it made a lot of its money. And that created the inertia to change. Whereas Netflix didn't have that problem. The next pattern you learn is as things evolve, um, practices co-evolve. And particularly when we change stage of evolution. 
So if we go from compute as a product, which had a characteristic of high MTT, a high mean time to recovery. So when your machine went bang, it would take you months or weeks to get a new machine to an environment of low MTTR, a low mean time to recovery. So when your machine goes bang, it takes you seconds, then your practices will change. We go from capacity planning, disaster recovery tests, uh, N, N plus one, which is best architectural practice for computers a product, to a world of new emerging practices where we're distributing systems designed for failure chaos engines. That was about 2008, 2009. And of course, those uh, efficiency enables innovation, it enables new needs. And then that's just componentization effects, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. And those new higher order systems create new sources of value and worth. So with something like compute goes to a utility, you get new practices, eventually we call them DevOps, you get new needs like Netflix, all basic. And you have no choice over this because if you're competing against others and they get the benefits of efficiency, speed, new value, they create pressure on you to change. As more competitors change, that pressure mounts until you are forced to. And that's known as the red queen effect. So you have no choice. Never was a question of if with cloud, it was always a question of when. Now, for me, this is really useful because I use a lot of those economic patterns that I've mentioned for that, as I said, there's 30 odd um, for investment. So it enables me to see where to invest. I want to invest in these future changing areas and also where not to invest. So I don't want to invest in, you know, best architectural practice on computers or product. That, that's where I wanted to move out from. So I used to run strategy for a company called Canonical. Uh, they provide something called Ubuntu, it's an operating system. So 2008, when I was running it, we were 3% of the operating system market against Microsoft and Red Hat. Uh, we use maps, it took me 18 months and it cost half a million pounds and I took 70% of all cloud computing. So if you were around in cloud in those days of 2008, 2010, you may have noticed it was suddenly Microsoft Red Hat, Microsoft Red Hat, and suddenly it was all Ubuntu in the, in the cloud. Well, that's because we mapped it, okay? And we used the maps to work out where directly to attack and focus. And literally half a million is all it could cost, take 70% of cloud. And today Ubuntu still pretty much dominates that space. Now, of course, the, the practice has evolved. Uh, eventually, Andy and Patrick gave that name, uh, uh, DevOps. And of course, the runtime, that's your coding environment. So in the past, LAMP.NET stack, that, that's evolved. 2004, we started to see utility uh, runtimes, things like Lambda. And that's creating new emerging practice and new needs. So that's going on at the moment. I mean, if you've been listening to AWS reInvent, 50% uh, of all new AWS services are built on Lambda. I mean, it's, it's incredibly fast acceleration. So today, you know, this is not 2020, this isn't 2010. Uh, tw in 2020, where you would invest is in that serverless space, the emerging practice, those new needs. And of course, all that other stuff stuck behind the inertia barriers is now the new legacy, um, including things like DevOps. Um, so, you know, if you're a company starting your DevOps program today, well, it took Netflix seven years to go from where it was with data centers to zero data center. Um, it took Rosalind, uh, um, Adrian, it took them about seven years in total to get that done. Now, assuming you move as fast or almost as fast as Netflix, which you probably, uh, most companies don't, we'll say it's going to take, say, 10 years. If you started your DevOps journey today, you'd be finished by 2030, by which time the entire world has shifted up or most of the world has shifted up to serverless and those new practices, which are all about things like capital flow, et cetera. So all you've just done is just created the new legacy. I mean, uh, embarking on a DevOps journey, fabulous stuff to do, 2010, uh, not exactly the right move to do today. And, and the point about this is strategy is obviously iterative. What worked yesterday doesn't work today. Of course, if you go to a DevOps conference and you say DevOps is the new legacy, they're all burn him, heretic, et cetera. I get used to being uh, called these things. 
So I'm just going to do a couple of little final comments and then we've got, we can open it up for questions or we can go down one of the magical mystery tours. Um, the point about these maps, all maps are imperfect representations of a space, of a landscape. Um, there's no such thing as the perfect map. So this is a map of France. It's not a perfect map of France. If you were going to try and create a perfect map of France, it would have to be one to one scale, which means it would be the size of France. It therefore would be France itself. Uh, so as a map, that would be pretty useless. So all maps are imperfect representations. And secondly, they're models. So they're all wrong as well. But despite being imperfect and wrong, they tend to be useful. And certainly in terms of learning patterns. Now, I've done a, a lot of mapping stuff within uh, governments. So I wrote something called the Better for Less paper with uh, Liam Maxwell. This is Liam and others. Liam was the CIO for UK government. Uh, just one project alone, um, we saved about 425 million by, by mapping that space. Uh, if you talk to Mark Craddock, because um, the stuff we, they did with the national statistics organizations by mapping out the space, they reckon they saved about 12 billion. So these can be huge amounts of money uh that are saved and um, there's a lot um of problems and waste caused by by stores um, but that's money uh, my 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 real interest is this sort of stuff so this is the royal national lifeboats uh where they use mapping to reduce call out times and that saves lives so rather than it taking you know 13 14 minutes for somebody the lifeboat the call to get to the lifeboat now takes about 18 seconds which means the lifeboat is more likely to turn up when you've fallen into the thames and pull you out alive than in the past where it was just you know that was it you're a goner oh. <clears throat> if you, uh, big favor if you can go on mute uh, that would be wonderful um, so it's also used a lot in venture capital because, uh, uh, you know, targeting how things change when you learn those economic patterns. One of my favorite is an Indian uh, venture capital firm, Upeka. Uh, they've got about 48, well, actually, it's more than 48 startups now, all, all using mapping. And they've all got fantastic uh, run rates and everything else, really good in terms of revenue coming in. Um, but it's used in all sorts of different areas. So. Um, a lot of it's starting to appear in books. So this is Reaching Cloud Velocity by AWS. It is the AWS's second ever book. You'll find about 17 pages of mapping in there, including an entire model known as Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize, which is basically how Amazon takes industry after industry. Uh, well worth reading. Um, there's a science fiction book called The Puncher's Scroll being turned into a film at the moment, uh, written by Tao Klein. That was all built with uh, a mapping. It's the, described as the new Ready Player One. Uh, the ones that really particularly, I, I, again, I love is things like the UN Global Platform, Data Platform. That was all built with mapping. Uh, that's targeted at reducing global poverty. So it's used in lots of different areas, science fiction, to UN, to commercial companies. Um, so getting started with mapping is really easy. The first thing you need to do, uh, and these are these doctrine, these, I said there are 40 odd um, uh, operating principles in doctrine. These all come from mapping uh, and these turned out, turn out to be universally useful. The first thing you need to do is know who your users are. Surprising how many companies are not very good at doing that. Um, so my tea shop, it was you know, business public. You could have government regulators. The second thing you need to do is understand their needs. So UK government, 2010-11, um, we were spending 16 to 21 billion a year on IT. We couldn't even get it down to the nearest billion. Um, we didn't know what the, we were doing actually with the money. Um, within about 18 months, we knew that we had 851 core transactions from people paying their taxes to a, uh, a, um, a relative wanting a license uh, to, to bury someone else at sea. So, um, you know, um, we, we got a good understanding of what the core transactions are, the core users, and then their needs as well. But that's not enough. Just knowing people want cups of tea, you've got to know and understand the details. So how to make a cup of tea. That's really, really important. Uh, one of the things obviously we've seen with COVID is people have poor understanding of their supply chains, etc. It's a pity. Um, but again, that is not enough. Knowing the details is a good step, 
But, you know, when we talk about something like a kettle, there's a world of difference between a custom built and a more commodity kettle. So you've also got to understand what is being considered. And that is when you get to having a map. Now, once you've got a map, uh, then people, because it's common language, people can add things to it. Why you should add stuff. Somebody else going, we should use robots. Um, we can also now challenge assumptions without the politics of stories. So I can go kettle. Why are we custom building kettle? Somebody might go brand exclusivity. Fair enough, we can have that discussion. The next thing is once you start sharing those maps, uh, you, that's when you start finding duplication and bias. And that's when you can start removing that. And that's a big problem for most commercial organizations. Then you learn to use appropriate methods, lean here, agile here, etc. And then uh, what you start to do is uh, something we set up in UK Gov uh, is something called spin control or a mechanism of challenge. So you basically you start doing what's called pre-mortem challenge. So before we go and spend money on a project, we're going to spend, you know, if we're going to spend 10 million or something or five million. In fact, in our case, we put the limit at about 50,000 pounds. Before we spend that, you can at least spend half an hour drawing a map and then allow somebody to challenge you on that map. Uh, and you can ignore them and then just go and do it. But at least then when we get to a post-mortem, we're going to have a map of what it was then what did we do, what did we learn from that, etc. And so this creates a mechanism of learning. Now, all of these doctrine um, that I've shown you here uh, can actually be mapped themselves. So focus on user needs requires or needs you to know who users are. To know the details needs us to know what the user need is. To understand what is being considered needs us to know the details. So these are the basic, most basic of all of them. Um, and this is what I call phase one. As I said, there's about 40 of them. And these are universally useful. So I've put these phase one there at the bottom. There you are common language, challenge assumptions. Most companies are pretty appalling at those. Um, but once you've got good at those, then you can move up to the next layer, phase two. Um, you know, there's things like bias towards action, realizing that strategy is iterative. Uh, when you get better at that, you can move up to phase three, because uh, a lot of the phase three depends on the underlying systems. When you get better at that, you can move up to phase four. And right at the top hand corner, uh, there's something called design for uh, constant evolution which is a cell-based structure mixed with a system of theft and multiple attitudes. Now, you can read about that. Uh, GCHQ is our intelligence services. Obviously, they have to continuously deal uh, with, with disruption. Um, and so they have that three-party structure. Uh, and it's all public. Uh, so they put it on GitHub. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, the three-party uh, system that they actually use is all Basically, yeah, it cites my work, so it's based on Pioneer Settler Town Planner anyway. Um, but in order to do this, and that's the really advanced stuff, you need to have all that other basic doctrine in place. Um, and the reason why I mention this is there's a tendency of execs to reach for that lever of organizational change. Don't. Uh, I try and avoid it. Um, you know, things you should always avoid messing with are strategy, uh, culture, uh, organizational change just don't do it because they're easy things to talk about and really easy things to mess up um, what you need to start with always is awareness as in understanding your landscape and doctrine so that's the operating principles and they can be a little bit boring and like oh we've got to focus on users and user needs and everything else but you've got to get good at that stuff before you can even start thinking about messing around with culture and organization and things like that it's just i mean just not with it. So I started off with the issue of strategy, talked about the importance of maps, talked about how most people are actually trapped by context, and then we talked a little bit about the patterns. So crossing the river by feeling the stones. The reason why I gave it this title is uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, a very famous economist and leader in China, uh, talked about the importance of having a direction and uh, moving in that direction by taking small steps and feeling the environment and observing the environment as you go along. And a lot of that is what you do with maps. You don't start by trying to map the entire space. Uh, you use iterative processes like spin controls. So every small project you challenge with maps. And as you build up maps, you build greater awareness of your landscape. 
And later on, once you've got good awareness, good doctrine, that's when you can start messing around with things like culture and strategy, and organization and things like that. So that's me. This is all Creative Commons, by the way. I've been doing this stuff for 15 years. You can just help yourself. Uh, Medium.com forward slash Wardley Maps. You'll find all the details there. Um, and list.wardley maps. There's an entire community of mappers around the world. I mean, uh, I get sent books all the time. I got one from the Puerto Rican government recently about their use of mapping, uh, which is fascinating read. And uh, obviously, I've got numerous books, uh, there's several more coming out because um, it's all Creative Commons and people use it in all sorts of different spaces, including, you know, reducing uh, illegal fishing, uh, stopping human trafficking, or lots of good stuff. So now we've got a magical mystery tour. All depends on time. Um, it'll take me 15, 20 minutes to do Pioneer Settler Town Planner, 15, 20 minutes to discuss the whole issues of digital sovereignty and, and, and some of the horrors of that, particularly projects like Gaia X. Or we can just take questions, whatever you wish. Well, we can see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, but if anybody has a question right now, you can unmute yourself and ask it right directly. Simon, I guess not. Or, sorry, to sorry. Yeah, that's a question from my side. Simon, uh, I'm really a bit overrun by all you said, and I really have to digest. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, I ask myself the question: Who uh, in a in a company should use your maps? Starting from the from the from the from the board of directors down or down to the strategy department or where else? So so um, if I look at a company like Adlam, so Adlam was a, um, uh, a security company set up by ex-Israeli um, military personnel, and it was uh, basically focused on uh, persistent threats against uh, you know nation-state persistent threats, reversing that process for using it to identify uh, weaknesses within a company. So in their boardroom, uh, they use mapping all the time. Uh, and uh, within about four or five years, they got bought by Microsoft, I think it was about 320 million. Um, so they ran from the board down uh, using maps. And so there's lots of examples of companies doing that. Now, sometimes maps are just used within project teams. Um, uh, particular areas. Uh, I, I've known individuals, uh, a friend of mine, Kelsey, mapped himself and as a result of mapping himself, he uh, left something called Core OS uh, and then he joined Google, he ran something called the Kubernetes project. Uh, um, so people, uh, it can be used at all different layers. Um, uh, so in, I know with an HS2, it started off in the IT function. It got to the point that the, the business function was actually then saying to the IT function, what should our business strategy be? because it was quite clear the IT function understood the landscape better than the business. Um, so um, it, it can start anywhere. It doesn't have to be from the board. Uh, it, it can be any group. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, perhaps perhaps a, a second one. Uh, would you say, okay, Maps is, is something um, Perhaps top down to explain some changes, some some strategic moves to uh, to the staff or something like this so, for dissemination. Okay, so for that one, I'll take the UN uh, Global Data Platform. So we start from mapping the United Nations and the purpose to reduce global poverty, and that goes through to things like all weather roads and all weather roads, whether that's needed for employment, goes through down to national statistics organisations and how we survey the systems, and from that we get to the underlying technology. So the, there's one side which is then looking at 192 different countries and identifying, look, we're doing this in different ways, we could be using satellites, et cetera, et cetera. There's another side, as some, as some people pointed out, is that they're working on these projects. They actually now understand mm -hmm. how their project connects to the overall purpose. Um, so, so it's quite interesting. A lot of organizations, they, they come up with, well, like I came up with bland statements of blah, and there is no connection. Um, we, we desperately try and sort of come up with, here's a vision thing. And, but, but, you know, there is no discrete connection. But in the United Nations, we can go from reducing global poverty all the way down to the, the actual systems that actually um, uh, are, are designed to, to make that happen. So, yes, it's, it's a good thing to do.
We also have another question in the chat uh, from yeah. Anders. Can you tell more about forecasting or future scenario mapping? Oh, so, so that's really interesting. So once you, I, I mean, I showed you about four economic patterns. Uh, and and I, the reason why I'm being so light in terms of I've shown you none of the gameplay is because, you know, we've got a short amount of time and it's so easy to overload people with this. Um, so I just kept it as light as possible. Now, so one of the things you start doing with maps is as you learn more about maps and, the, and those patterns, you can obviously take a map and you can say, right, we know components are going to evolve. We know we're going to have inertia. We know it's going to enable higher order systems. So we can start to identify where things are changing. Um, there, there's something called the three horizon models. Um, and, and the interesting thing is where the three horizons are depends on, on where you're, you are on the map. So, for example, if you're in a product space, the next, you know, you, that's horizon one. Horizon two is the move to a utility. Horizon three is the novel and new genesis being built on top through componentization. If you're in the utility space, horizon one is now the utility. Horizon two is in the genesis. Horizon three is in the product. So the point about this is where your horizons are vary where you are on the map. So what you can do is you can take a map, you apply common economic patterns to see how things are possibly going to change. And then often we'll do scenario planning. Uh, and by that, we'll take up uh, groups of people will take up different roles as competitive actors on that landscape. And then we'll play our games. And from that, we'll learn other ways of countering. And so the example I'm thinking of there is uh, use of drones for terrorist attacks. So we had uh, groups, uh, we, we mapped out the landscape. We had groups being, you know, I happen to be on the terrorist side and, and others were on the defender's side, uh, working out ever more wicked ways of exploiting uh, the landscape, which of course informed us in terms of how to defend against various things as well. So yes, you can use it for forecasting, you can use it for scenario planning. It's very good for that sort of stuff. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure. Uh, in, the, uh, in the chat, I see a uh, few people asking about the sovereignty block, that if we could go into that. Um, we could, uh, I would ask you if it's possible to do it in like 30 minutes, uh, 13 minutes, sorry. Like 13 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay, but we're gonna have to shoot really quickly for, 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 for that. So hang on a second. So we keep on the agenda time a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, right yeah. Here. Sorry. No, 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 no. It, it's, quite, it's quite a complex one, just to warn you. Right, okay. Sovereignty. So physical sovereignty is really, well, it, it, it's not easy, but, but it's, it, it's, it's relatively understandable because what you have is a, 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 an area which you've surrounded with a border and within that border is your collective, your behaviors and your values. And that's what we're trying to protect. And often, you know, or unless we're invading others, physical sovereignty, in which case we're imposing, you know, our collective is imposing our behaviors and our values onto somebody else's landscape. Okay. Right. Now we have to get to this to digital sovereignty and there's a lot of things to explain. So I'll go as quick as I can. Um, you remember I said about HS2 using multiple methods. Um, so using outsourcing, um, off the shelf products and, and agile all at the same time. Okay. So that's that principle and principle part of doctrine, that operating principle of using appropriate methods. But actually, something else is on that map as well. What you've got are two different beliefs, um, and they happily coexist at the same time. One is a belief in people over process, which is on the left-hand side. One is a belief in process over people. Okay, which is more on the right hand side. Now, often when we talk about beliefs or another way of saying beliefs is values, we can have uh, beliefs which are exclusive, as in I believe in, I don't know, God or not God or whatever it happens to be. And we can have beliefs which are, are not mutually exclusive. They are opposite, but both can exist happily in the same space because they have different contexts. All right. Now, this leads us into the talking, touching on the subject of culture. Now, culture is a really difficult thing. Uh, as Kroeber said, uh, despite a century of effort, uh, to, uh, yeah, anthropologists have been unable to define culture. Uh, they don't, can't agree. And they're the experts. 
And, and the problem uh, with defining culture um, comes from my favorite anthropologist, Margaret Mead. Uh, Margaret Mead talked about language is a discipline of cultural behavior. Now, why is that a problem? That's a problem because of Kurt Gödel and Gödel's incompleteness there. So no model can be complete and true within itself. And what that means, if language is part of the model of culture, you will not be able to describe culture using language alone. So that's the problem with coming up with a definition of culture and why no one can agree. Now, if I go back to the, um, uh, the HS2 map, you see at the bottom it says Genesis Custom Product Commodity. These are just different stages of evolution for something. And in fact, they're labels. Officially, I should go stage one, two, three, and four, and the labels for activity is Genesis Custom Product Commodity. For practices, novel, emerging, good, and best, data on model, divergent, they're just different labels. Now, I don't use one, two, three, and four because, you know, if I used one, two, and three, and four, uh, I used that in a map and went stage one, stage two, so it's just not very meaningful. And that's why I put the labels in there. But, you know, if I'm looking at practices and I go Genesis custom product commodity, for practices, it doesn't quite fit. Well, I could use those labels, novel, emerging, good and best. So I put that at the bottom. Yes, you know, no users is good heading towards best practice, focus on user needs, heading there. Great. So I can mix and match. Um, these, these all come from a piece of work I did, which was about 9,223 uh, publications. Don't worry, it was just nightmarish long, long time ago. But I can I mix and match. I can go concept, emerging, convergent, accepted, and use those as labels. So I do that when I'm mapping out things like ethical values. So you start off with a collective. It might have values of universal basic income, paid holiday, unionization. So concept emerging, convergent, accepted doesn't mean that paid holiday, for example, is accepted in that collective or universal basic income might be emerging. Um, but these are based upon underlying components, workers' rights, civil rights, maybe the abolition of slavery, reciprocity and fairness. All of these components have evolved. OK, so it's not like um, our abolition of slavery was there at the beginning. It started off as concept emerging, converging and then became accepted. OK. Now, what I will do is I will often take the high level, more visible values uh, and group them into what I call a pipeline. So every collective likes to succeed um, and succeed by that. I mean, we spread our values to others. And these are the high level values, you know, civil rights, anti-discrimination, unionization, workers' rights might be accepted. Paid holiday is a bit of a spectrum, universal basic income, you know, much more emerging. Now, if I take that and keep on expanding, then I end up with basically a map that looks like this. And this is basically a map of culture. It's imperfect. Um, and like all maps, it's a model and therefore it's wrong. But it starts with two anchors at the top, the we and the me, uh, the balance between the individual and, and the collective. And within there are concepts like power and belonging and behavior and values, enablement systems, doctrine, safety, gameplay, memory, rituals, and landscape as well. So from this, you know, it's not singular. You belong to many collectives, your company, your family, your nation, or your church. If you belong to a church, a football club, or whatever it happens to be. You can't just copy the values from one to another and expect the culture to be the same because there are so many other components involved. So you can't just go, what are the values of Amazon? They've copied those, will be the same. You won't. Uh, you can adopt uh, operating principles, uh, mindful of the fact that they are linked to landscapes. When you implement them, they will be different. So focus on user needs. Uh, you can implement that. Of course, your users may not be the same as somebody else's users. And that's useful for competition with others, by the way. And the other thing is you have feedback loops. So sometimes these feedback loops can be positive, like our collective succeeds and is economically succeeding. We're spreading our values of democracy. We feel safe. We have a sense of belonging, etc. Um, to our collective, uh, but they also can rapidly become negative as well. So it goes the other way. Uh, and so we saw a little bit of this with the UK um, uh, with the loss of public trust that uh, has been happening. 
Um, right, so sovereignty. We've got that collective behaviors, values, landscape. This is the, the line, the connection between these things. So this sounds complex. How does it matter in the digital world? Well, very simply, this is a map of the automotive industry. Uh, this is rolled forward to 2025. So this was done in 2014, DVLA, um, because obviously when people don't have, um, when I mean, you start getting self-driving cars, people won't have licenses. Uh, it's about 400 million in cost to the UK government. So we just took the automotive industry back in 2014, rolled it forward roughly to 2025. And of course, overlaid China's play. So China is very public about its play and it's all about special economic zones and moving up the right-hand side of the stack, same as Amazon, lots of strategic, lots of good play by China, uh, same as Amazon. And of course, it means if you're a car manufacturer, then this stuff all in the middle is increasingly becoming invisible, a commodity. You, people won't even own cars. They get them on a utility basis. So how do you differentiate? Well, you do it by status. And how do you do that? Well, we suspected somebody would come up with a digital subscription model based around route management, infotainment. Sure enough, four years later, BMW says, oh, we're going to do digital subscription. Yep, we know. We saw it coming. Okay. So there's a problem with that. So in this world, you don't own a car. You, you, you basically just use a car, but you've got gold members and platinum members and silver members. So if I'm a silver member, I might have a terrible car experience in terms of I get adverts played at me all the time, uh, whereas gold member, it's a wonderful experience. Not a problem. We can cope with that. The problem occurs when gold members coming along in their car and or silver members are in front, then silver members move out the way because we've embedded route management because they're self-driving cars and gold member gets their journey faster. Sounds great, except for we've embedded social inequality into the transportation system. And from a government perspective, when we have a flood, that means poor people die, wealthier people don't. The next day we got pitchforks. So we have to, uh, not only do we anticipate that somebody in the market would come up with this daft idea, we have to put in place legislation to stop the worst excesses of this. Right. But there's something else as well that we're very mindful of. Intelligent agents require simulation models, training. And it's in those simulation models and training that we insert our values of the collective. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it's like the trolley problem. If you're in a very much a society focused on the we, the collective, and you've got the trolley problem, do you kill one person or do you kill five people? You might go, well, it's tough luck for the one person. But you know, that's if you're in a society based upon an ethics of care. If you're in a society which is very transactional, based upon the ethics of choice, and you've got one person and they're very, very wealthy and the five people are unemployed, you can imagine a situation where people will get insurance so that they are protected, so it's tough luck for the five. So one way or another, we will start embedding our values into those systems. And you see this with uh, Beijing. It's the 100th anniversary of the CCP next year. They're announcing, um, you know, we, we knew this was coming, reducing, they've reduced poverty. They've basically got rid of extreme poverty, landing on Mars and all this sort of stuff. Their next attack is inequality, which is a real problem for us in the West since our system is built on inequality, um, so built on exclusion. So basically, they're, they're saying in their AI, they're going to embed these ideas of benefiting as many people as possible, etc. And so this is what digital sovereignty is really about. Because at the end of the day, it's digital sovereignty is about deciding where your borders are in this landscape, where your collective is going to operate, where your behaviors are, where are the values going to operate. Now, you cannot do this stuff without maps of the space any more than you can do physical sovereignty without maps of the landscape. Unfortunately, what we've got is endless storytellers giving us it's all about data, it's all about blah de blah uh, but with no visualization or maps of the actual landscape. Um, and so, you know, this is why I see projects like Gaia X and everything else. Great, wonderful stories, not a map to be seen anywhere. And it's a bit like trying to do, you know, physical borders without looking at the landscape. It's just daft. There we are. There we are. That's your answer. And I finish with one minute to spare. Wow. That was quick. See, you manage it. <laughs> well, of course. Always.
did you enjoy that was that was that all but did you find interesting or yeah oh good good fantastic good pleasure very um, good comments coming here great stuff uh a comment from florian have you mapped the brexit ah oh. <laughs> so so there are a number of mappers who are uh, there are a few mappers who are involved okay i'm not involved um if i if i was you know i'd immediately be uh, so one of the things i do like is they're, they're talking about something called kent borders as in um uh, i live in kent having borders with the rest of the uk and that's i i hope that's what they're planning on doing because you know if i mapped it out um i'm not saying i have but uh, <laughs> i would always i would be definitely doing multiple free trade agreements in bordered areas within a single country and doing a, a cross-border trade within it uh, within a single country i think there's all sorts of opportunities in that space um but i'm i'm not involved i i'm not running their play i know there are some mappers in there uh, i am curious to see what they come up with all right uh again simon a lot of um messages coming in the chat thanks great was really informative and also from my side on behalf of the whole community here that's gathered here today. Thank you. It was my really pleasure. extremely enlightening, inspiring, and also fun. Uh, and also thank, thank you. you for all your answers. Uh, please, please feel free to stay at the bar camp and visit sessions or talk to the other participants if you have time. You'd like to we'll do take. that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for yeah. having me here.